Hello, I'm Kendall House, and in this presentation, we're going to discuss evolutionary psychology and another use of the distinction between proximate and ultimate that's found there. I hope you enjoy it. This presentation is called, What is Evolutionary Psychology? From Ultimate Explanations to the EEA. Our question is, what is evolutionary psychology? And to answer that question, we're going to discuss seven core themes or concepts or ideas uh, that uh, define the parameters of evolutionary psychology. And the first of these is just the argument that psychology is fundamental to explaining our behavior which isn't surprising given that it's called evolutionary psychology. And anthropologists have actually had a large role in this. And so the approach to evolutionary psychology that we're most interested in here derives from a book called The Adapted Mind. And two of the authors, the co-authors of that book, Jerome Barkow and John Tooby, are in fact anthropologists and the third, Lita Cosmides, is a psychologist. So anthropology has had a big role in some areas of evolutionary psychology. So evolutionary psychology, to understand it, uh, as launched in the adapted mind, rejects cultural explanations, which they more frequently refer to as the standard social science model abbreviated SSSM. Uh, so why do they do this? Well, they argue that cultural approaches have been agnostic about psychology. So what does this mean? Well, consider Albert Einstein sticking his tongue out at us. Uh, what's that behavior about? Well, in a the standard social science approach, no concern is given to what might be going on psychologically. Instead, you have an input at one end, uh, ideas, and then an output at the other end, behavior, and the ideas that ideas generate behavior. So whatever cultural ideas we learn, that leads to behavior. So we can use the word culture to refer to the input and behavior to the output, and in what the authors of the adapted mind call the standard social science model a culture determines human behavior and what's going on in our brains is left in a black box that means there's no concern with what's going on there and another way that's expressed is to say that our brains are a blank slate and we become whatever a culture writes on us uh, we have no innate dispositions so in doing this, besides uh, removing psychology, the argument is in the adapted mind that the standard social science model also relies entirely on proximate causation and excludes evolutionary approaches. So our second theme then is that evolutionary psychology is all about ultimate causes. And that is why it's called evolutionary psychology. So here's an example. Um, the question is, why did I buy my wife a dozen roses? And of course, this is purely uh, hypothetical because my wife will tell you he's never bought me a dozen roses. Um, but the proximate explanation of this behavior would be ideas. It would be it's a cultural thing that you should do that. And therefore, you go shell out money uh, for cut roses that are going to die in a few days. Whereas the ultimate explanation would be, well, it's an evolved adaptation uh, that should improve uh, my reproductive success. And so what, uh, what gives rise to our behaviors? Well, according to evolutionary psychologists, it isn't cultural ideas. Instead, it's special purpose behavior generating devices, which they call modules. So we have these cognitive modules in our brain, and our brain is something like a Swiss army knife. This is the favored metaphor. Uh, 
And we're not blank slates, but rather we come loaded with innate dispositions that are quite specific and leading us to behave in specific ways to do certain kinds of things. So the third theme here then is that your brain is modular and each module in your brain has its own evolutionary history. It's been sculpted by natural selection and as a result uh, you behave in certain ways. Now in stressing these evolved modules there's also a stress on genetic adaptation and the argument is that in one way or another these modules are genetically evolved and that means that they're complex structures and the metaphor or the analogy that was used in the adapted mind was the human eye. So the human eye is a very complex evolved structure. It has over 30 components to it and it took some time to put this together. In fact it evolved among mammals and then primates and humans simply have an old world primate eye um, but it has a long evolutionary history to it. And the argument is that our genetic adaptations are so complex partly because they are so old and so many different mutations have been gathered together gradually to improve them. And what follows from this, if our genetic adaptations are very old, is that they're basically adaptations to what's happened in the past. So for example, perhaps uh, humans recoil when they see a snake um, because it's been very good to see snakes and there's an argument by an anthropologist named Lynn Isbell uh, that human uh, visual per acuity has in part uh, evolved to see snakes and that's a western diamondback rattlesnake that you might step on in the foothills of Boise if you're not careful. So out of this we get the fourth theme here. So the fourth theme is this idea of the EEA which is the environment of evolutionary adaptation and its original usage it was adaptedness um, but now it's usually the environment of evolutionary adaptation that's referred to and this is the environment of the past uh, where our behavioral features uh, were selected uh, by natural selection. And this idea first uh, gelled in a, the work of a psychiatrist named John Bowlby in what was called attachment theory. And Bowlby argued that the primate pattern of mothering was what he called continuous care and contact mothering. And an example of that is we find in chimpanzees and gorillas. Uh, chimpanzee and gorilla mothers are constantly in contact uh, with their infants. And so Bowlby argued that that was the environment of evolutionary adaptation, this uh, archaic primate pattern, and that human mothers also uh, display continuous care and contact mothering. Now two consequences follow adaptation. And the first thing that follows is that our adaptations are species typical. And what they mean by this is that human maternal behavior shows a lot of universal patterns to it. So if we come back again to the idea that evolutionary psychology established itself in opposition to the social sciences, then social sciences tend to stress cultural diversity. The evolutionary psychologists say, hey, look around the world. And whatever society you're looking at, you're going to see mothers uh, carrying their infants and in close and continuous contact with them. And that's because it's an old a species typical adaptation that's shared by all humans. So the fifth theme here then is that evolutionary psychology is very much focused on human universals and argues that cultural diversity is greatly exaggerated. The sixth theme is an emphasis on maladaptive behaviors in the contemporary world and this might surprise you. You say, well I thought it was all about adaptation. Uh, but the argument here is that what worked in the environment of evolutionary adaptation, the EEA, uh, may very well not be adaptive in current environments. So maladaptive psychological universals, this is really critical even though in the contemporary world 
These psychological universals might lead us to behave in maladaptive ways. It doesn't mean that they aren't evolved adaptations. It means that they're simply out of sync with our current environments. And a favorite example that's drawn on to illustrate this is, of course, our desire for sugars and fats and meats. And this shows up very much in a fast food meal of a cola and a burger and fries. And in our current uh, environment where we can get a great deal of that food very cheaply, that's very maladaptive. But in past environments, it would have been adaptive. Many of the cognitive adaptations that evolutionary psychologists have proposed that have met with controversy, in fact, they were arguing that these well might be maladaptive today. So they weren't saying this is a good way to behave. Uh, they were just saying this it evolved in the EEA. And one thing that we note around the world is a tendency of older men to chase younger women. And they have this really uh, honorary way of stating that, that younger women have more reproductive value. And that means that they have more reproductive years and hence potentially can give birth to more children. And this leads men then to switch constantly towards younger women. At the same time, we seem to not be surprised when women are around wealthy men. And the idea there is that surprised when women are around wealthy men. And the idea there is that women uh, in the past, a man who had status and wealth, uh, gave greater likelihood of offspring surviving. And this is why women are attracted to men with more resources. Um, it's also been uh, noted that young men are risk takers and uh, more prone to a dramatic outburst of violence in the world. And the idea is that they're trying to impress young women or perhaps form coalitions with other young men, but that this also evolved in the past. And a real striking example is that in industrial societies today, cultural success is not linked to more reproduction, but to less. So individuals with the greatest cultural success, the most education and earning power, tend to defer reproduction until their 30s or 40s and therefore have very few children. So the last theme here is that the focus of the standard social science model has been on culture. But evolutionary psychologists argue that culture is just a recent thin veneer and that it's silly to speak about cultural adaptations because the adaptations that matter are much older and they're genetic adaptations. And as Sarah Hurdy puts it in Mothers and Others on page 37, uh, logically, language comes later. And language is usually taken to be the very foundation of culture. And this pushes culture then how to the driver's seat in terms of shaping human behavior. Thank you for listening.